Roger, the question of the freedom of the will is one of those perennial questions that philosophers ask all the time. Uh, it's important because it is, it's a probe, a litmus test of how we think about ourselves. I've talked to mm -hmm. scientists who believe it's entirely deterministic, it's our brains and molecules and everything else, and people who believe that the world is pure consciousness and we, it's the we who do the controlling of everything. From your perspective as a scientist, as a psychiatrist, and the kinds of research you've done with um, people from the meditative traditions. What kind of information do you have that might help us with this problem? Well, like so many people, I have puzzled over the question of free will mm -hmm. and have come up stumped. I end up feeling this is one of the great mysteries of life. When I look at the neuroscientific evidence, which I've done a lot of, yes, we seem to see deterministic patterns there. But yet, when I look inside, I clearly have a sense, as all of us do, of making choices. Inside and your own head. <laughs> inside, <laughs> inside my own head, yes. <laughs> when I do that, then I like to think I have choice, that I have some freedom to make decisions. One thing that is very clear from my clinical work with people is that it makes an enormous difference in people's lives as to whether they feel they have free will. And one of the signs of psychopathology, for example, of severe depression, mm. is that people feel helpless. They don't feel they have any control. In fact, one of the ways to get people depressed is simply to put them in environments where they feel they have no control. But the other side, even people in any environment can feel a lack of control if they're depressed. So the practical implication from clinical experience seems to be that there is real value for us in choosing to see ourselves as having choice. And out of that, we seem to open to a wider range of possibilities. We take more responsibility for our actions. We see ourselves as having other possibilities and opportunities that otherwise we tend to overlook. So even though it may be an illusion, it's a helpful illusion in a pragmatic way because it makes our lives better? It may or may not be an illusion. I don't know. But certainly I know from clinical experience that it practically and pragmatically it makes an enormous difference. But is that, that data interesting and useful? The fact that thinking we have free will, it makes our lives better, richer, more in control. Would that indicate in some some uh, subtle way, then maybe that is true? Well, it perhaps lends some weight to that idea. I certainly don't think it's conclusive. At least it doesn't seem to have convinced a lot of philosophers, mm -hmm. but then perhaps nothing will. But it certainly does give us some, it gives us both practical information and yes, perhaps it biases the argument or thought towards the idea that we do have choice. Well, what's the mechanism involved where a person who is depressed thinks that they don't have the, the freedom to change or free will? How does that work psychologically? Well, depression is associated with certain kinds of thought patterns. One is I'm bad. Another one is it's hopeless nothing I do is going to make any difference. So people actually fall into a particular way of thinking and a particular belief about their lack of self-control and self-power. And the extraordinary things about beliefs is that they tend to be self-fulfilling prophecies. The uh, car maker Henry Ford was also a pretty smart psychologist, he said, those who believe they can do something and those who believe they can't are both right. <laughs> and that certainly seems to be true in our clinical experience. So one of the things we do as clinicians is try to help people examine their beliefs when they're depressed, that I can't do anything, nothing I do makes a difference, assess their reality, and most people decide, well, actually, no, that's not true. I, if I look at my own experience, it does seem like I have some choice and I do have, have power and opportunities. And that can be very healing. Are there any other kinds of clinical syndromes in which the apparent or real freedom of the will has impact other than depression? 
Very much so. One of the hallmarks of some kinds of schizophrenia, a very severe psychotic disorder, can be the sense of being controlled by outside forces or people. Uh, this can also occur in paranoia, where people believe they're being controlled by malevolent forces or malevolent people or radio waves. So these are basically delusional systems that people have of being out of control. My favorite uh, aphorism is just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get me. <laughs> yes, it certainly feels that way at times. <laughs> so each of these clinical states, uh, the, the, the freedom of the will in its, um, in its operative uh, uh, mechanism ha has impact. Very much so. Very much so. It's very clear that this, the sense of personal control or what psychologists call self-efficacy, one's own capacity to be effective, is one of the strongest determinants of psychological health. And can you see it, for example, in cases of schizophrenia and paranoia, where you can make an, an affirmative positive difference by giving the person a, a, a feeling of more control? Well. Schizophrenia and paranoia are very difficult right. cases because in those cases the delusional belief systems are often very, very firmly fixed and it's very hard to talk people out of them. It's amazing how resistant those beliefs can be. So usually these people need medication of some kind and then they can be open to uh, therapeutic interventions and the uh, changing of their own beliefs. But an example where intervention really does make a positive difference is, for example, in depression, where people are open to examining their beliefs and as a result of changing them really do undergo dramatic transformations. And then it's also of great value to those of us, you know, normal people, because our beliefs are also extraordinarily powerful. And our beliefs about who I am and what I can do and what I can't run our lives. So one of the things that is important, not only for healing pathology, but for enhancing well-being and growth, is the examination of our beliefs, and particularly beliefs about how much choice I have. I think that's interesting because most of us uh, feel governed by circumstances and we really never stop to think about do I have freedom or don't I have freedom. We assume we can do things within certain kinds of social constraints. But perhaps reflection on this is something that would be, would be useful in terms of being able to uh, improve our lives in, in, in the environment in which we, we're, we're all living. Yes, indeed. All of us are affected by our environment in very powerful ways. And yet uh, many uh, psychologists and existentialists, those philosophers who are particularly concerned with our existence as human beings, the deeper issues, point out that we always have a choice of how we respond. We may not be able to control our environment, but we do have a choice of how we respond. And the existentialists say that actually our unwillingness to acknowledge our own power and capacity for choice is actually a sign of inauthenticity, being dishonest with ourselves, shortchanging ourselves, robbing ourselves of uh, the recognition of our own potency and power and responsibility.